Today's video is about gravitational fields and gravitational force. The first thing we need to do is look at the representation of gravitational field as a model. The lines here represent the direction of the force, and for gravitational fields, those lines are always pointing inwards. The density of the lines represents the strength of the field. And you can see that those lines never cross because these lines represent vectors. If the lines were to cross, then you would have a resultant vector that would point in a different direction. So they never cross. And also, they continue out to infinity. So although you have to finish them somewhere, when you're drawing them, you need to realize that a gravitational field has an infinite range. So this is what we call a radial field. We have met these before. I will put a link to my electric fields video here because there are lots of similarities, particularly between electric fields and gravitational fields. These are fields that you need to be able to compare. I will point out the similarities and differences in them as we go through the next couple of videos. And at the end of the next video, then I will summarize all of those for you. At the surface of the Earth, although the gravitational field is radial, as we saw, at the surface it appears to be uniform, and you can treat it as uniform. And let's look at what the definition of a gravitational field is first. You need to be able to reproduce this. So this is something that goes on a little card for yourself so that you can just learn it off. A gravitational field is a region in which a mass experiences a force. That's it. An old friend makes an appearance here, small g, gravitational field strength. Now we should know, of course, from GCSE that we put gravitational field strength as 10 newtons per kilogram. Or once you get into A-level, you use it as 9.81 newtons per kilogram. Now note that unit, because you may have used 9.81 meters per second squared as the acceleration due to gravity. But G is gravitational field strength. It tells you how many newtons of force the gravitational field of the Earth pulls each kilogram. And so therefore, we know that G is equal to force per unit mass. And I'm going to point out here that electric field strength is force per unit charge. So there's one similarity between them. Your field strengths are defined in very similar ways. Now you need to be able to use this equation, but you must be very, very careful because this equation only applies when the field is uniform. Like we model the field being at the surface of the Earth. So there's only a very small portion at the surface of the Earth, and that small portion is everything we have been dealing with before of which you can use a g of 9.81, or where the g is constant. Okay, so obviously Isaac Newton is a large player in this gravitation game here. The story is that an apple fell from a tree onto his head, and he thought about the moon, and he came up with the idea that gravitational force acts between all masses. His universal law of gravitation is the law that tells us exactly how much gravitational force there are between two masses. So let's just say you and the Earth. And the size of the gravitational force depends on your mass. Because we know that you get pulled for 9.81 for every kilogram. So therefore, the more kilograms you have, the more force is going to pull you. It also depends on the Earth's mass. A larger Earth will have a stronger gravitational field, and therefore, a stronger gravitational field strength and pull you with more force per kilogram. Now again, I'm using you and the Earth as an example here. This applies to all pairs of masses. The third factor that affects the size of the gravitational force is the distance between the, your centers. Now it's very important that it's the center. And that is normally given the symbol R as opposed to D because when you stand on the Earth, it's the radius of the Earth that is the distance between. Now, if you increase your mass, you increase the gravitational force. If you increase the Earth's mass, you increase the gravitational force. And if you increase the distance between the centers, it decreases. So he came up with the equation, and you don't need to know any derivation of this necessarily, that F is equal to G M1 M2 or big M small m over R squared. This big G is a constant, a gravitational constant. It is given to you in the data book. 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. And most importantly here, it is the square. So there is a dramatic weakening of gravitational force with distance. It is infinite in range, remember, so it never actually drops to zero. There is no such thing as zero gravity. But it does get very, very weak very, very quickly. 
And because of that, small g gets smaller very, very quickly by the same token. And again, up until now, we have used small g a lot to look at gravitational force and to look like at things like gravitational potential energy. But that is only for human-sized distances from the Earth. Once you start getting into astro distances from the Earth, you've got to abandon the idea of small g being constant and being at 9.81. One thing I will point out here, and you may have spotted already, is that this law is very similar to another law that we've met before, which is, of course, Coulomb's law. So this is another similarity with electric fields in that their forces are governed by very similar laws. You need to be able to use this law remembering that that R is between the centers of the objects and not between their surfaces. This diagram gives us a nice example of how the force decreases with distance. The force from the center of the Earth to the surface of the Earth is modeled as a straight line. That would be assuming that the Earth is a uniform density. It's obviously more complex than that in reality. But we are more concerned about what happens once you go off the surface of the Earth outwards. And of course, it's an inverse square relationship. So you get this dramatic drop and you, it becomes effectively zero out at about six times the radius, but not actually zero. There is a required derivation in this topic. And so we use Newton's universal law of gravitation. And we're going to use the idea that small g is equal to F over m. So the force per unit mass, that's what gravitational field strength is. If we cross multiply this, of course, we get F is equal to mg. Now we have two expressions that give us a value for gravitational force, which means that we can equate them. So we end up with Now, these two small m's are going to cancel because that is the mass that is brought into the gravitational field as opposed to the mass that is producing the field. And so we get an expression that small g also decreases with the square of the distance. So there's an inverse square law with small g as well. The consequences of this equation, the gravitational field strength has got nothing to do with the mass that you bring into the field and only to do with the mass that's creating the field, which makes sense. And also that g decreases with the square of the distance in the same way. You need to be able to apply these equations and equations of motion and previous work on Newton's law for orbits, the orbits of planets, the orbits of satellites, in any situation. And so this is Johannes Kepler shown on the screen here, and he produced a set of laws that govern planetary motion, and they were produced by observation based on previous work for other, from other astronomers, but very detailed observations. And so they're empirical data. In other words, there wasn't a theory to back them up. He just looked for patterns in the data. Until Newton came along and produced his laws of motion, and his laws of force, and his law of gravitation. And so we're going to see how Newton confirms Kepler's third law in particular, which was to do with how the time period of an orbiting body is affected by the radius of the circle that it orbits in. Now, you need to be able to apply Newton's ideas to orbital bodies. So I'm going to show you one of the possible derivations and how these things fit together. So we know from Newton's second law that F is equal to ma. We also know from our study of circular motion that a is equal to r omega squared. And I'll put a link into the circular motion video where we derive this. Now, we're assuming that orbits are circles. That's a fairly large assumption but the mathematics works out and it's a good model. That means that F then is equal to m r omega squared. Now that F is for the centripetal force, in other words, the force that is holding the object in a circle, the force that's holding the orbiting body in its orbit around. And of course, that's gravitational force. So now we know that that's equal to gmm over r squared. Again, we can do a little bit of cancelling of the small m's. And then we're going to do a little bit of rearranging. If we cross multiply, we get... Now we need to put in some indication of the time period of the orbit. And of course, we know that omega is equal to 2 pi over t. 
and this is where our time period appears. So if we substitute 2 pi over t in for omega, we end up with r cubed 4 pi squared over t squared is equal to g m. And we can then just solve that for t squared, giving us t squared is equal to r cubed 4 pi squared over g m. And what this is telling us, in other words, that t squared is proportional to r cubed, which is what Kepler said in his third law. Also, the time period is independent of the mass of the object that is orbiting, which is interesting. In the next video, I'm going to be doing a question that applies these ideas, so showing you how it is that you can use the idea that centripetal force is gravitational force in this instance, and use these equations to find T, R, whatever it is that you need.